Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Mondays with Moshe. This is Moshe Norman out of Lakewood, New Jersey, here with a, another unique program tonight. So tonight we are actually deviating somewhat from our regular talk on mental health because we're kind of going to go into a topic that um, really overlaps tremendously with the work that we do as mental health professionals, especially those of us who are school counselors and involved working with children and the child population. Um, there's this, this mystery that many of us struggle with in working with children and I guess young teens um, in the school system. And that is, I guess, if we want to put it simply, it's the notion or the idea of discipline. Um, we've all been through the school system, uh, you know, personally through our journey. We've all had our share of uh, trauma or struggles within the, most of us within the school system. And um, uh, as well-intended as so many of our you know, people, teachers who go into this field of education are well-intended people. They're caring people. They um, want to teach. They want to influence, for the most part, the really good people. And at the same time, I did a, uh, you know, personally, just a little short little summer stint of teaching, uh, uh, I would say about 15 years ago, just to try it out and see what it's like. Uh, it was a short summer uh, camp job. And um, one of the things that I learned is that uh, you know, as much as you might love kids and be interested in influencing and teaching children, it's not necessarily as easy as it seems because the information may be something that all teachers are privy to, especially, you know, just, just with life experience, we can teach children and it's not all that complicated. But what happens when you're in a classroom setting and you have uh, that kid or those children, those boys, those girls who just can't manage, you know, typically in the classroom setting, whether it's behavioral challenges that they have, whether it's attention challenges that they have, uh, whether it's family stuff that's going on at home, it could just make teacher, uh, classroom teaching quite complicated and challenged. And especially uh, when you have children who can't succeed in the classroom and then they're acting out almost as a defense mechanism, we might see it from the mental health perspective. So, uh, tonight, I invited, thanks to Aaron Herzog, who helped me out, um, and we found somebody who is a true expert in this field, Larry Thompson from Kansas. So thank you, Larry. Good evening, and thanks for joining us and good agreeing to, good to be with you. Yeah. Well, yeah, good to be with you guys. Yeah, so we're really excited tonight about this process and really learning about, about um, how to manage children uh, in and out of the classroom setting, especially in the school setting. And I do truly believe that this will be mutually beneficial, both for um, educators, school personnel, as well as uh, social workers, school counselors, uh, therapists who are working with children and need to interact and perhaps enlighten or bring some insight to the school faculty in working with these children. So thank you again, Larry, for joining. And do me a favor, tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got into the world of education and um, tonight's topic, which is responsibility-centered discipline. Tell us a little bit about what that means and how that came about. And then of course, we'll talk about what it is. So- All right, well, I started in that probably pretty traditional track of going to be a teacher and a coach. Ath athletics probably really saved a kid that you know, like me that didn't come from a lot and was needing to find something you could be successful at. And so I, I gravitated towards some coaches that saw some talent in me. And, and so school was for the most part, a place I liked being, I mean, I had some struggles. I had some teachers that it felt like didn't like me and that I didn't want to go to those classes and stomach aches, you know, as a little one for certain grades that I was in where the teachers corrected with shaming and embarrassment and and those things so I had those experiences as well but for the most part I found school to be a place I kind of like to be I wouldn't say I was deeply driven academically yet you know as I was just kind of filtering through life but I wanted to do well and was, was willing to try pretty hard and with a little encouragement do uh, do the best I could and so 
I naturally leaned into maybe I should be a coach and a teacher and, and I had success in sports. And so that lent itself to um, kind of wanting to coach kids. And I found, man, when you coach them, you can even get connected in even better ways, you know, because you hear a lot about stuff outside of school at practice and those types of things. So I started down that journey. And uh, before I even started into the field of teaching, I was a kid that, you know, didn't have the money. So what am I going to do between finishing school where I was on scholarship, athletic scholarship? What am I going to do when that ends? And then I have a teaching job that doesn't start until August. Well, how do you pay your rent, you know? And so funny story, but uh, a coach came to me, one of my college coaches and said, Hey, I heard about this opportunity it might be a good fit for you. It's uh, it's running a camp. Um, the city of Omaha, Nebraska sponsors a camp for kids that wouldn't be able to afford to go to camp. Um, and then police officers and firefighters are the counselors, but they need somebody to run the camp. And I said, uh, okay, what does that mean? You know? So had to get my bus license. I had to drive around and pick up kids from the low income housing areas, uh, 11 to 13 year olds, 60 at a time, um, get them out to camp. And these kids come from all varieties of backgrounds. And, you know, once you got them out to camp, the behavior started as soon as you told them they couldn't do something. As long as we just did fun, it was working. But as soon as you can't time to quit swimming and time to get ready for supper, then somebody's going to fight with you. Uh -huh. And uh, then I watched the police officers and the firefighters try to deal with the kids, you know, and one is saying, you know, give me 20 push-ups right now. And that worked fine until the kids said, I'm not doing push-ups. You do them if you want push-ups. Then, then they would point to me and say, you're, you're going to deal with this now. Uh -huh. And then I watched another one take a kid down to the student store and get him a candy bar and sit and talk and try to help him figure out how to do better. So everybody was trying to get something better with the kid's behavior, but everybody was coming at it in really different approaches. Uh -huh. And what I found is when I took my first principalship, I taught for seven years. I taught both regular ed, and then I ended up teaching special ed and had my own self-contained classroom for uh -huh. kids that had a lot of emotional um, struggles and uh, had a lot of success. So they kind of coerced me into taking over a really tough alternative school. It was an alternative school that had been through five principals in one year, very violent, um, third graders through 12th graders, couldn't keep staff, couldn't, you know, and I took the job after lots of resistance and lots of encouraging. And most of what I get to share today and the books that I've written and the things really originated in the experiences of that, because one, I was in way over my head um, they had tried so many school discipline programs. You know, you can get online and find 50 different ones to buy and try. Um, but they're all tended to be rooted in the same two strategies, either build relationship or prizes and punishments. Right. And so, so I, was every say, from, I was listening to your description of the firefighters and, and the police officers, and I'm thinking, that's pretty much what it comes down to, that everybody knows one of two things. I was going to say either bribes or rewards yeah. uh, versus punishments. So a lot of that's going to yeah. be rooted in the way you were raised. And, you know, if you if you were raised with what they call colloquially tough love, then you're going to go the punishment route and try to show the kid that you love him and they care about him, but but very punitive and uh, um, consequences. Uh, and if you're if you're the other kind of guy, whether it's you were raised with a lot of love or you figure, you know, we know that punishment is bad, so we're going to go with the prize route. Then you start giving out prizes and rewards. And I'm not sure that either one of those is actually adequate. No, I'm going to I'm, I'll, I'll show that kind of the learning that we had with that. You know, when I got to the school, um, they couldn't have assemblies because the kids would plan riots. They couldn't, uh, they no longer could have computers in any classrooms because the kids would break them or take the the ball out of the mouse and hide it or get mad and push it off the desk. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they were in a very difficult spot that the building was trashed, the carpets were ruined, they had old furniture because kids would cut it and break it and stick their pins through it and you name it. And so when I got there to meet the staff, they were not super excited for their sixth principal to show up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the reluctance was there and everybody's leaning back in the chair, like, Oh, another person. And 
And it didn't really help to say, hey, I have some good ideas. <laughs> so did five other people that came before you. Right. Um, so we started slow. And I honestly could say I tried some things that didn't work very well. But it was in such a, a bad way that they really let me almost try lots of different things to move the kids forward. And one thing I learned right off the bat is they had point systems. So kids were in these point systems and a teacher could take their points or add to points. And, and now I understand why more with the brain research, but all that does is get a kid most of the time to be more manipulative and start manipulating how to get points. Um, the kids that want the points and do it, we probably could have done something without a point system. They were willing to work hard and, you know, but the ones we were trying to move were manipulative and, and saying things like, well, if you don't get this in the store, then I'm not going to try it today. Uh, or that teacher took my points and I didn't even do anything. We never really saw them relating it back to their behavior very much. So those were systems that I had inherited that I began to work like we're going to move away from some of these traditional systems. Uh, I always wish I could recognize the teachers that were there because I didn't fire everybody and I didn't bring my own team. It's the exact same teachers. And it took some time and it took some retraining of the teachers because most teachers that come into the workforce and education don't really get prepared for behavior. That's right. That's they're right. told again, if you if you build a relationship, if you get to know them, you know, they, they're told all these great phrases. But when a kid's swearing at you or threatening you, you know, you got to be able to are you feeling that. or are you feeling threatened by the child or you're feeling threatened yeah, yeah. by so, your own your own inadequacy because the, the kids aren't complying yeah and so what happened then is we began to look at what why can one person walk in when a kid is losing their temper and talk to them and in 10 minutes the two of them walk out and the kids regulate and why can another person walk in and they both end up wrestling each other to the ground it's what, such an important what was, question because what was being said differently and how could we teach everybody to be the first person well i'm re if you have an answer to that question i'm really excited i'll tell you something when i was in when i was a kid in grade school we had a principal who was a really unique fellow um years later uh when i was already a practicing therapist i actually reached out to him and asked him if he would do a training um on his strategy and he said he he would agree to do it but he'd have to actually um figure out how to put it into words but what he would do is he'd walk up and down the hallways of the school um just very very slowly very deliberately and didn't hardly almost said a word and everybody would scatter and you know get to their seats there was something about his presence um that that really you know imposed a message that I'm here and everybody should just calm down and get into their seats without hardly ever saying a word. Sometimes he'd use, you know, finger motions like come here, but really, really not using a whole lot of words. So if you were able to identify what it is in, in a, the a teacher's presence that enables them to connect with a child provide that sense of safety, that sense of security, meaning I'm the authority here and you're okay. I'm not going to hurt you, but we also mean business and that kind of um, wholesome uh, presentation. I'd love to hear exactly what it is because well, I'll take, I'll go a lot further than that with you. I'm going to show you how you can build it in every single person that works in the agency. Excellent. Because We've got to go past the point of whenever there's a problem, we'll take them to so-and-so or the teachers radio and down. I need help in room five. And, and there's only four people in the building that can help. Right. So what happened it's for me- It's all about putting out fires. And then it becomes- yeah. We began to realize if you're the only person in the building that is comfortable doing CPR, that every time somebody goes down, you are needed. And see, I say, we have CPR training but most of us aren't ready to go really do CPR just because we went through the workshop with the Red Cross and got a card in our pocket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a difference. And so we have to retrain teachers for what their brain goes into when it hits fight, flight, or freeze, that they can still get to their skills, Excellent. which is very different than most training. Most training, you sit with a cup of coffee and a bagel with your friend and you talk about trauma. And then when a kid's going off in your classroom, you go, well, I had trauma training but I don't know what to say. 
You know, so we learned long ago that we are going to be so prescriptive. But in doing that, the danger is we can't sound like like we're trying to all say the same words. You still got to leave the genuine side where people can be themselves, but they can use the same skills as each other. So that's what, you know, I'm, I'm a believer. I grew up a preacher's kid. I'm not Jewish, but I, I know that God gave me this to help children because I've reached too many people and I speak to too many people that have educations way beyond me that need help, that I know it had to have some divine help in figuring this out. Um, so I can dive into that. But what I wanted to tell you is that school that couldn't have assemblies, that couldn't have technology, four years later, we were the first alternative school to win the governor's award. And we won it by being one of the best 15 schools in the state at technology. Wow. So the kids could do it. They, they but not under the way we were trying to strengthen them. Okay. I went on to a traditional high school that told me we don't have those bad kids like you're used to. You know, they were, they thought I came from a different world. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, you're a top 100 high school in the nation, but you still have 26% of your kids not meeting your test scores. That's behavior. Mm -hmm. They're like, what do you mean? I said, that's behavior too. Behavior isn't always throwing something and causing a commotion. It's they, they won't do the work unless they want to. Being able to persevere and do something, that's behavior. Wait, Larry, so said, Larry, you just you just show you. you just said the key words here. I think this is the, the key words of what we're going to be focused on tonight, unless they want to. Okay, so I imagine I don't know much about responsibility centered discipline, which you're going to share with us now, but I imagine that one of the key functions to make successful students is that that line unless they want to is somehow inducing a process where the child actually wants to. Is that right? Um, no, not exactly <laughs> how I see it. Okay. Um, what I would say different on that is you and I both do things lots. We both, you and I do several things in a week to be professional and to learn and to grow that we don't want to do. But we can both get ourselves to do it. Yes. So sure. I think there's a misunderstanding that I teach teachers across the nation. We've got to stop saying this kid's not motivated. And this is Larry Thompson world. You can take it or leave it. But I began to learn motivation to me is a derivative of your self-control. So if you see me working out at six in the morning, it's not because I want to. In fact, I don't want to. I start thinking about how much I don't want to the night before. But if you saw me doing it, you'd be like, he's motivated. So there's a misconception in a lot of our teachers' minds that motivation means I like it and I desire it. Motivation is a, is a piece of our self-control, which means I know what I get from it will matter so I can get myself to do it today, even though I don't get that till later. That's that delaying gratification in our self-control. So I don't get hung up when a teacher says, this kid doesn't want to. I say, well, their muscle of self-control is weak. So what are we going to do to strengthen it? Because everybody's going to face making yourself do something that you don't want to do because you know it's good for you. I have a funny quote on some posters some schools use, but it says, I said this to a young child once that was melting down in one of our New Orleans schools, and she was probably 14. And I said, I'm going to just talk to you like one of my kids for a minute. I said, I know the school's upset with you, and I'm trying to help you. But I said, let me just share something with you. When you can get yourself to do something you don't want to do because you know it's good for you you'll master your life. Well, okay. So Excellent. that's the trick of life. When I know it's good for me, can I build enough strength inside of me to do it? So what we're going to talk about tonight is we're all about strengthening that muscle of self-control in kids. And one of the key ways you can do that is you've got to stop presenting rules and start making them skills because nobody minds resisting you because you have a rule. In fact, I lead, I talk to thousands and thousands of people a year. And if I have a room of 5,000 teachers and I say, my name's Larry Thompson, and I've written this many books and I have a few rules when I speak, just me saying rules has 50% of the audience lean back and cross their arms and say, man, I don't want to listen to this. Why? I'll show you that. I'll show you a slide about it in a second. But there's a part inside of us that does not want to be controlled by anybody else. Yes. And the more you start trying to tell me you're going to control me and just saying rules. So I just filmed a video for the state of Kentucky's teachers and for all their first year teachers, we retrain them and say, don't start your class with here's the rules. 
because you said just put 50% of the kids against you. But how do we train America's teachers of old? You know, you write it down on the board. The first, the first thing. What you're going to do if they don't. Write it down on the board. In this classroom, we raise our hand. There's no talking. There's no calling out. Rule, 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 rule. Now, I don't want teachers to confuse that with people do have to have a clear expectation so they know the standards. But when you present them as here's what I'm going to do to you if you don't, I mean, I always show funny examples in training because I'm in the trenches so much. I'm with kids, you know, most of the time. So that's like when you say to a five year old, hurry up and they slow down. <laughs> that's that part of like, you can't make me walk fast. I, I say this quote to teachers all the time. You, you can use it with people. I, I found it to be one of the most helpful things I say is you got to think like this. What makes this child feel strong in my classroom when they meet my goal or when they don't meet it? Because if it's when they don't meet it, you're in for a long school year. Okay. So, so think about me sending some kids down the hallway. Let me just set up a kindergarten class. Class, we're going to go to the library. And I don't want you touching each other. We don't need you touching people. Nobody likes it. So keep your hands and feet to yourself. And if you can't keep your hands and feet to yourself, then you can walk with me at lunch and practice. Well, you just triggered a whole bunch of autonomy brains to start fighting you. So what a lot of kids are going to do is when the teacher's not looking, they're going to touch the kid in front of them. They're going to slow down and the kid bumps and then they're going to say, you're touching me. Why? Because I feel strong when that teacher doesn't have control over me. Now let me set it up as a skill and watch the difference in the brains. Class, we're going to be going to the library in little. And I know a lot of you have good friends in here and you're tempted to like touch each other and just that's just normal. But one of the things we're working on as kindergartners is to start learning to be respectful of people, which means everybody would like their own space. So our goal is to try to leave everybody in their own square. So let's see if you can. Now, if you think it's going to be hard for you, I would want you to volunteer to walk with me. And then I'm going to coach the people that think it's kind of hard. But the ones that think they're ready and they can do it with that group line up first. And then the ones that want me to walk with them line up second. Beautiful. Beautiful. What so, you're going to have is a whole bunch of little kids going down the hallway like, look how good I'm doing. Right. I can do it. I mean, I'm not being cheesy with the kid, but I have to teach teachers. You get the brain to start fighting for a bit of autonomy. It doesn't matter what consequence you give it. You can say you're out for three days. Good. I didn't want to be here anyway. You're not going on the field trip. I went to the zoo last year. It's stupid. It doesn't matter what you do. We can say to a high school kid, you're expelled. Good. I don't care if I graduate. Larry, it, it sounds like I got I got to structure this in my brain better. You know, it's going too fast, but it sounds like you're almost using the same desire that the child has to resist in a positive way. So it's like if I tell you don't do it, you're going to do it. If I say I'm not sure if if you can, this may be too difficult for you. You're going to try. To control it yeah but a little less I, I, I want i don't want the way we teach it to sound like we're trying to manipulate a child mm -hmm. but we all want to work towards a common goal and so i have a school then pick i i make them work very deeply on this or i ask them to work very deeply on this i'll show you some from my jewish communities but the first thing i say before we even start talking about behavior if you have five years with this little one in your elementary school or, or four years at your high school with these kids, what, what are the most important things you build into their life? I mean, if I could, if you could only give them four skills, so if this is the magic wand, and I say, Moshe, you get to tap each kid on the head in this class, and these are the four skills you get to put in their life, what are you going to give them? I want to get teachers very focused, because the problem is every classroom is doing different. And, and that doesn't work if you learn math a different way every year. So behavior can't be that different either. We are laser focused on the four things we want our children to learn in our building. Now, these will be different from place to place. But too many schools do the same generic ones. Be safe, be respectful, be responsible. They haven't thought those through. They don't mean something deep to that teacher. And you and I both know in raising children, when you have a talk with your child that's struggling, you have no trouble talking with passion about the things that matter to you and your family. And so we have to help teachers move from here's my rule to 
Moshi, I want to talk to you because I saw something today that didn't demonstrate respect. And one of the things our school is built on is people can't learn in a space where they don't feel treated well. And the way that you treated a young man at recess hurt his feelings. And, and that makes his entire day harder to learn. And I appreciate the kind of kid you are that you have friends, but not everybody has as tough a skin as you. And not everybody can just roll with that. That wipes some kids out. And I'm going to ask you for a way next time when you're tempted to say something that could hurt of how you're going to stop yourself. And I'm not comfortable putting you back at that recess till you have one idea you think might help you do that, which could still be before next recess, but I just need you to think about it so you could master that on your own and I don't need to stand out. Where are you at on that? That's what we call actually a give them five conversations. There's five things I've been trained to do inside of that conversation to move your brain where it needs to be. I'll show them to you. But that's a very different conversation than you're not going to talk to kids that way at recess. So if you think you can say whatever you want to people, you're then you're not going to this afternoon. And now the afternoon, he's going to sit inside and go, I'll talk to that kid at lunch that way. Then you won't be in lunch. I'm going to still win this fight with you. Um, so one of those nuances is, well, let me just show you a little, because I, I mean, I got, you know, I do so days. While, while you pull it up, let me, I just want to make some, a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements. If anybody has any questions, please uh, go to the bottom of your screen, hit the reactions tab and raise your hand. For those of you who this is your first time on Mondays with Moshe, you'd like to sign up, please send me an email. I'll put my email address in the chat box, but it's mnormanlcsw at gmail.com. If you're here as an educator and it's your first time here, just let me know uh, in the email that you're an educator and I'll put you on the separate educator teacher ready list. Um, and I do want to thank uh, uh, both uh, okclarity.com for sponsoring and for, to achieve behavioral health in Muncie, New York for making this happen for the educators. So thank you for our, to our sponsors. And um, Larry, of course, if you want to share any information about your trainings, we can put that in the chat box as well. You can share it later. But yeah, let, let's let, let's understand a little bit. I think we have to understand a little deeper the difference. Yeah. You know, one of the things you keep talking about is is self control. Obviously, self control is a great builder of confidence. It's a great builder of self esteem, and th there seems to be a strategy or a style that you have in inducing self control in a child. But at the same time, when you you gave the example of you're working out at six a.m. Uh, you know, there's one very striking difference between an adult and a child, and that is an adult is making his own decisions. I want to work out because I want to be healthy, stronger, et cetera, you know, release those endorphins in my brain and feel good. Uh, but when you have kids in the classroom, they don't they don't think as sophisticated and as deeply. They're just kind of impulsive and do what feels right and what feels like it has to happen. So how, yeah. in fact, and again, if this is part of the presentation, you can hold the question, but how, in fact, do we get bring a child, move a child from uh, being just impulsive and and defensive, which is why a lot of kids will act out, uh, to, to actually desiring uh, self-control and self-discipline? Well, I'll show you that in just a little bit, because it's inside of those five things that we do when we talk to a child. Super. And so... Yes, you're definitely on the right track. Let me jump ahead so we can get a little deeper into it. So I just like people, uh, you know, this came out of a framework that Daniel Pink wrote a book about it. He, he wasn't actually that I know of the, the researcher, but he took the researcher's uh, wisdom. Um, then this is all over the world. So it isn't just like a Western culture idea. It's more of just a human condition. But I always like teachers to understand we're trying to get the, the drive or the things to move the, to the internal place with the kid instead of external. And even teachers that do a lot of prizes, um, they would rather not have to do them if they could, but they're just afraid they can't get growth if they don't do prizes. So what I would say is they have to understand these pieces, the autonomy, which I talked about just a little bit ago. Autonomy is that feeling of I like to be in control. It's mine. Um, and we want people to have autonomy. But when the brain begins to fight for some autonomy because it feels like it's threatened, that's when that child or all of us will start to act out. That's when we'll show that we're not going to be controlled. You know, that's when an adult will say, I don't care if I get fired. You know, they'll say real things they don't mean in that moment because they're fighting for some autonomy. 
Actually, what I began to learn is this. Once that brain starts the autonomy fight, the goal changes. The goal changes to show you you don't have control over me over any other goal. I mean, I've seen it so many times where they'll say exact opposite of what they actually want. Power because struggle. they're just trying to show they're not in control, they, that they can't be controlled. The next place we want to move the brain to, and we can with skill, is that mastery phase, which desires to show you it can do something that takes skill and is hard, something that requires their full focus and engagement. So mastery is easy to see in, in young kids because they'll just say it. They'll say, like, did you did you see the picture I drew? You should hang it up. It's really good. They'll say things as they get older, like, did you hear about my game last night? You know, they'll, or older kids in high school say, hey, did you hear I got a job? Like, they're wanting to tell you, I just want you to know, I, I do things that are hard. Like, I can do things that take skill. And, and we do the same thing. If you build a deck on the back of your house, you're probably going to have some friends over to see it. Like, you got to come see it. Like, I spent all summer doing this. Like, that's that brain and mastery. Like, I can do things that take skill. All right. So the last one is purpose, which you can also get the brain in the right space if you feel that you make a difference for the good of others. Like I'm needed for the collective good of the group. And that's why a lot of times kids that have a job at school, like if I'm not there, mom, then the fish could die because I feed the fish on Mondays. Like I got to go to school today. That kid, what's activating the, the desire to do hard things and good things for that kid is that purpose. So I kind of show this and, and uh, I, I show a story that became a, a very well-known story in some of our books that happened with me. I was training a kindergarten, was training a school and a kindergarten teacher was through the two days of training. But before I left, she said, is there any way you would come and like meet with me? Because I got one little boy that's like just really making my life hard. I said, absolutely. So I spent some time with her and She'd gone through the training. We call it a give them five conversation. I'll show it to you in just a minute. She had practiced it and coached it. And, but she said that this little boy, his name is Jeremy. And I don't, he has so many behaviors. I don't know where to start working with him. I said, well, what, what behavior would help him and you the most? She said, well, the one that would help me the most is if he could get down the hallway without, you know, just messing the line up. She says he gets out of line. He goes to get a drink and then everybody's thirsty and I got to stop. He'll go in the bathroom when it's not bathroom break. He'll drag his hand on the bulletin boards. It, it just, it's a mess. She goes, and it's embarrassing because then everybody looks at me like I can't manage my class. I, I said, what have you tried so far? She said, well, I've given him consequence, which I said, that's where everybody would start. So what was the consequence and how did it work? She says, I don't want to tell you what it is. I said, well, I'm not here to judge you. So I'm here to help. So go ahead. It's probably recess, right? She says, yeah, I take his recess. I said, okay, how does that work? She goes, well, it worked for like two or three days. But now he just says, I didn't want to go to recess today anyway. It's hot outside. That brain goes right back to that autonomy fight. Um, I said, have you tried anything else? She says, yeah, I was talking about it in the teacher's lounge once. And they told me I was doing it backwards. They told me I need to make it all positive, that I should like make it all positive instead of a threat of a negative. So I bought a treasure box and I put things he would like to win or earn. So I showed him all these little trinkets he could get. And then if he doesn't touch people in the hallways all day, then he can pick something or morning and afternoon. I said, how'd it work? She said, it worked for about three or four days and now he doesn't care anymore. I said, what makes you think he doesn't care? She says, oh, he says things like my mom has better candy at our house than in that box. And then he said, that one's free at McDonald's. So he's, this is some research Stuart Avalon shares in some of his presentations, but um. Even a five-year-old knows you're manipulating when you use prizes. It's just they'll let you manipulate them if you keep the prize good enough. But as soon as the prize isn't good enough, I'm not going to do it. And the prize never generates the feeling of mastery. Or very seldom. It could, but it's rare too. Well, because you got me. You got me to do it. So we're back, we're back to um uh bribing and punishing, which doesn't seem yeah. to doesn't seem to Left. So I'm going to show you now what we did with the teacher. I said, so you learn to give them five conversations, which I'll show it to you in just a second. I said, let's practice doing that with Jeremy, positioning his brain for the growth, and then spotting him and helping him if the lift's too heavy for him for a little while. Larry, can, so can I we, said, before, we, before we proceed, 
to the actual intervention. Can we take a question from Fredo who's been raising her hand or his hand? I don't know. Sure, sure. I can't see that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Fredo. No, this isn't Fredo. This is Herschel. It's just on okay. Fredo's uh, yes. uh, uh, machine. Uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly where, I mean, I hear what he's doing, and I have many children like this in the school that I teach. And we're trying all this thing, but to give, to make it, in other words, to make the child own what he's doing or what she's doing, I still haven't gotten there with, with that. You know, we try, we try everything. But you do have these children that you just can't get through them. You know, they try, they they burn out, and with all the encouragement in the world, it's just the kid's in his own mind. And I'm an educator. Okay. Well, let's, well, I think that's where Larry's going, right? Is to figure yeah, out. That's exactly where I'm going. Okay. So, um, and I say this with all due respect, I work in boys' prisons. Um, I got called in by the state of Ohio to three boys' prisons that are the, one of them's rated as the worst five in the United States. Um, so it's easy to say some kids. I said, well, the way you're doing it, they're going to stay some kids. Let me show you a different way. Um, you talk about a resistance group, of, resistant group of people. I mean, you got both pendulum swinging, slam them on the ground, treat them like adults, cuff them, stuff them, stick them in their cell. That's the punishment side. And then you got the therapy side of they just have had problems their whole life and you got to go through more hours of therapy. And I'm not saying those aren't needed, but there's no consequence or no umph behind that. And then the kids started manipulating. And so, I mean, the framework that I'm using tonight, I can't do it in an hour. I mean, I could do it in two days, but I built that framework at that school and we were, they were hiring me to hope they could raise the graduation rate 10%. Now, I'm so school focused and systems minded that when we do training, I can measure how much you've implemented. So I don't want to come back in a year and say, how's it going? And you say, oh, pretty good. I'm like, let's look at your data. What I'm looking at is your teacher's skills, how often they use the process, how well they use it with fidelity, and then what result they get from it. Not just we went to training one day and we tried it. In fact, I have a new book coming out with Corwin Press. It'll come out in May, end of May, that's that's written to those school leaders on how you build a system in a school. But at that facility, I mean, you're talking about kids. They had a teacher killed in one of those buildings. You're talking about kids that you would say have very little self-control. Fighting, gang violence, mopping up blood at passing periods. I mean, I've seen as extreme as it can get. We put these practices into place and it was work to retrain staff. It was work to hold kids accountable for every behavior they do. See, it's easy. This is one of my most popular lines I say. What we do right now and even the question I just got, we tend to hold kids in school accountable for the consequence, but not accountable to change their behavior. Those are two different things. I'll say that again. We tend to hold kids accountable for the consequence, but not accountable to change their behavior. So what we do is we restructure true accountability for the behavioral change. I can show you ways to do that. But at this facility, when a kid has a problem in a classroom, the first thing we do is interview the teacher to be sure they coached with fidelity. Then we show the kid all the support that was given them and we make it a skill. Why was that hard for you to take help from somebody? We're gonna move that brain from, I, I don't feel strong anymore not being able to do this. I look weak to the whole place. The graduation rate went up 53% in 18 months. Wow. So tell us a little bit about how, how do you do it? Well, let me show you with Jeremy. I'll model it to you with Jeremy here. I'm gonna do a give them five for a little five-year-old. But after she tried all that stuff, he got worse. So I said, well, do your give them five. I said, I would do it like this and I'll show it to you right after this. I would do it something like this. I would get Jeremy one-on-one -on -one after I sent the kids to art or PE. I would say, look, buddy, I don't know how to help you. I keep telling you ways to get down the hallway that work for my brain, but they may not work for yours. And I don't want you to miss out on friendships because here's what I see happening. Some of the kids are getting mad at you because when we have to line up over again, they miss time at recess and art. And nobody wants to come to school and not have friends. So I'm going to try to help, but I can't fix it for you. 
So I think the best thing we could do for a while, instead of being number three in line where you're at right now, I'm going to have you move back and I'm going to coach you a little bit for a while. We'll walk together and I'll coach you. And if you start to forget, I'll give you reminders. Plus, I'll get to know you better. But if there's ever a time you think you can do it and coach yourself and you don't need my coaching, then I would ask for how you're going to coach yourself and we could try your way. But until then, let me be your coach. She said, that's not going to work. I said, well, what you're doing now isn't working either. Would you try it? But I kid you not. I said, OK, I'm going to be a five year old. I'm going to sit in this chair. And now I want to watch you do the skills with me. I already gave you an example, but I want it to sound like you. I love this teacher. This is a veteran teacher that could have blown me off. But what she did next is stood over me like this and said, young man, some things are going to be changing in my classroom. I said, well, my brain just said, old lady, no, they're not. She said, what? I said, yeah, you didn't do give them five. You told me my behavior was changing and that's going to get you the same result you've been getting. She said, oh, God. I said, let's go back and rebuild it. I said, now, I don't give my number out very often, but I said, I'm going to give you my phone number. You do this with fidelity and you stick with it for a few weeks and watch what happens with this kid. She says, you think it'll work? I said, it all depends on how good you do the skill. You can't act mad that he has to walk with you. You can't make it punishment. It's just coaching till he's ready to coach himself. She called me two and a half weeks later and said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, oh, I'll believe it, but I'd like to hear the story. She says, he uh, walked in this morning, he's five years old, and he said, Miss J, so can I go back to my spot now, number three in line? She says, well, I don't know. I haven't heard how you're going to coach yourself. He said, I brought buttons today. She said, what are you talking about? He says, my mom has a jar of buttons and I got two out. I put one in each pocket. I'm thinking if I go down the hallway and hold on to those buttons, it'll probably not remind me not to touch stuff and I'll do fine. She said, well, in a half hour, we're going somewhere, so let's see. He did fine. See, the way that she was trying to punish him made her, him want to just show her the punishment didn't hurt. And then the bribes just made him feel manipulated. So he didn't even like the prizes. It's pretty much what we do in school all the time. I could tell you a hundred of these stories. I got a kid in a prison that can't quit fighting. He has more assaults than anybody in the facility. When you're the most violent kid in a maximum charge boys prison, you're pretty violent. So he gets in another fight and they asked me to work with him. I spent 40 minutes with him. All I had to do, he's in an autonomy fight. I had to move him to a mastery fight. I did a give him five with him, but it's going to sound way different because he's a 17 year old gang member. But I said, I don't know how to, I mean, he was very rude to me. So it wasn't like he loved the conversation, but I said, I can't tell you how to stop it. I only know how I don't hit somebody when I'm mad. He says, nobody can stop me. I said, I already know that. They've pepper sprayed you in the face. They've put you in your cell for hours. I already, they've tried all they know how to do. What I'm trying to show you is none of them can stop you. But I'm trying to show you how you stop yourself. Because at some point, you're going to get out of here. At some point, you want a different life than this. So all I'm saying is you're going to have to find it inside of you. And here's what I'm going to do, because I can't let you hurt people. I'm going to send a guard with you. They'll be on a one foot restriction. And as soon as you don't need that guard, you tell me where you don't need them. When you say, I don't need that guard in second period, I'm fine in that class. I get along good in there. I'm doing good. I'll back them off. I'll back them off as soon as you tell me you got another way. So, so are we? Well, guess what? 60 days later, I was in the facility and he was walking down the hallway and I was training 150 guards and he walked in the room and he said, can I talk to you guys? I said, yeah. He goes, I just wanted to tell everybody in here, 60 days, no fights. I said, how did you do it? He said, I make a fist like this now instead of like this. Because when I get mad, I make a fist and I'm going to hit somebody. But if I hit you with my hand like this, it breaks my hand. And that slows me down enough to get out of there. I'll show you what that brain's doing. So let me show you that real quick. When you give the brain a task to do, it's one of two categories. When I give you a job or a task to do, you either have the algorithm for it, which means you follow the set course of instructions to the conclusion. It's like knowing a mathematical algorithm. You know how to do the problem. If you don't have the algorithm, then you have to get in the heuristic spot of your brain, and that's where you have to trial and error with it until you find an answer. Let me just ask you, everybody listening, 
how many of us listening tonight is punctuality one of your strengths and being on time is easy for you? Well, in a group of adults, it's usually 50-50, but everybody can tell time. So sometimes have some brains have a time algorithm. It's easy for them. So if you have that, you can't understand late people. They annoy you. You're like, plan ahead. What are you doing? You knew we started at seven. If you don't have the time algorithm, you got to do something that's a heuristic. That means it's novel and unique and creative for you. So if you know people like this, they set clocks ahead in their cars. They have alarms that go off on their phone to remind them to leave home now. You don't need that. And so one of the things that we've learned over time is many of our kids that are struggling to manage their behavior are going to have to use a heuristic, which means engagement, a trial and erring way of figuring out the way they do that. I could show you hundreds that kids come up with. That kid that did this to not fight, that's a heuristic. Nobody could have come up with that for him. Jeremy putting buttons in his pockets. I have a kid that cried. I was in a New York school. He finally broke down. He'd been suspended the week before. When I got there, he sat in the office. I said, I can't take you back to class till we get it resolved. You're going to have to get in a different part of your brain and work with me on it. It took me about 30, 40 minutes. He goes, I didn't want to tell you this. I said, what? He said, my mom made me go see a counselor. I said, don't be embarrassed by that. We all need to talk to people when we're having hard times. He said, yeah, but I found out I have anxiety. This is a seventh grader. I said, yeah. He said, I'm just going to do this under my desk when I get super mad. And so I don't say disrespectful words to my teacher. I said, I don't understand what this is. He says, that's my way of telling my lungs to do my breathing because my therapist is working with me to use my breathing to get myself back regulated. That's a heuristic. Cool. But what, when what, you use what, what, what punishment and reward prevent the brain from being able to get to a heuristic. That's why we have kids trapped throughout this nation in school. Larry, I'm still I'm still trying to wrap my head around what gets kids to want to do this. So I'm listening. I don't care if they want to do it. But that what, means what gets that them to, means, to agree to that's it. where everybody's let me just tell you, that's where everybody's missing the mark. They think you can coerce a kid into seeing it the way that a 50-year-old teacher sees it. You can't. So let me show you what it's different than that. And I don't, I hope that didn't sound tone disrespectful. See, the mistake we're all making in schools is once you find the, the, the thing that they love and then get that, then they're gonna, the magic's gonna turn on. No, it won't. It will still be hard. I love to be in shape, but it's still hard. I love to do certain things, but not every day. Here's the give them five. So let me show you how you embed that into a give them five. A give them five is I train you, and this is what it would look like if I was training you. Let me just show you this because this will help it make sense to you. Um, see these people here? They each have a sign and they're practicing give them five. This is actually in a Jewish school. Um, there's five signs. And the way that we can train these into you is we put you in a behavioral scene where you have to coach a behavior. And this sign will only go down when you do it. So that's how we're going to train you. So let me show you what they are real quick. One of them is, I'm going to show, and they don't have to be in an order because you're going to have to do these when the heat is on and when you're tense. So one of those is you got to show them that you're on their side, you're supporting them. I'm not against you. I'm for you. Now that doesn't mean I'm okay with your behavior right now, but I'm here to help. So when you start like this as a teacher, you ought, that one gets violated right off the bat. The next one is what is the clear expectation? Well, I don't have time to do those tonight. I'll show you one in just a second. You got to build for your school. What are the three or four most important skills for kids to have? So whenever we talk, we would go to our wall. We put them on our wall. Moshi, you know, here, one of the things that we value is being able to persevere and give good effort, even when you don't feel great. You know, perseverance is one of our goals. And I'm noticing that you're not working today. Now, breakdown is where you have to identify where the skill is not being met. So the kid very specifically knows what part's failing. That could be as simple as I heard some words you were saying at recess. I noticed that you cut in the line and upset a few kids. Make sure they know what we're talking about. And here's the hardest one for most people. 
how does that benefit this child to change that behavior? This is where you got to start to think in the currency the kid carries. It might be trust, Moshi. You know, when I can trust you to not hurt a kid's feelings, then I feel much more comfortable saying, go get a drink when you want one. But if I don't know what you're going to say to kids in the hall, I might feel like, wait till I can go with you, please. But that may not be Moshi's. Moshi may want to be a leader or Moshi may be a kid that doesn't want to be a leader. Please don't make me get up in front. There's where our teachers needing to know the child a little bit has a benefit. I say this pretty boldly to my faith leaders out there. If kids don't see a reason for the faith, a true benefit for the faith, they get to choose to leave it later if they want to. So I sure hope our schools aren't coming at them strictly out of control, 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 and they're seeing the benefits of the faith. The reason a faith school would have these on the wall, and the last one is closure. Can we get it resolved, and can we move it through? So Moshi, me acting this out to you, I did those several times. So let's do the recess one, but I'll do it in a give them five framework. You can see me click these off. Moshi, I know that you didn't mean to hurt somebody's feelings. You've never been a kid that I've seen been, be mean to people. But I think your frustration got the better of you because people got in front of you on the slide and some of the words you said hurt a kid when you called him this name. And one of our goals at our class is we would respect each other. And that can be super hard when kids aren't being respectful to you. So before we're done, I need to know if you're being treated right by some others. But I want you to think of a way that you could stay respectful, even if other kids are falling short. And you know why I say that to you, Moshi? You're a leader. You're one of those kids in the classroom people follow. And it's not always fair, but leaders have to hold themselves to a high standard. I believe you can do it. So think of a way that even if the class slips, you stay strong and model for them. So before we go out to recess this afternoon, just think of a way and let's talk about it when we walk out together. That's a give them five. But now when people learn it in the beginning, they sound like this. I want to support you. The benefit is, you know, they sound very canned until they get enough practice, like I, like I showed you in those repetitions. But let me show you one of the things you got to do to help people be good at it in the moment. You got to build these foundations that we call them foundations um, that, our, that our schools can get to um, that they coach from. So I want to pull up one that, that you guys would probably enjoy. Can we, can we take a question? Can we take a question? Yeah. Okay, MG, please unmute. Okay. Hi, I'm a teacher. I have taken your training before and I really find that it works with children on, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, I've seen children who were like completely transformed, but I'd like to introduce it as a, like to my class, like in general, we have this, we've implemented um, the system in the school. So the kids are taking responsibility, but I find myself falling away from it at, on a whole class level. Can you give a couple of examples of like how you would implement it in older grade? I don't know, like fifth, sixth grade um, on a whole class level, like preemptively, yeah. not, not when yeah. dealing with like terrible behavior, when, when you right. have three children speaking during a class or something like that. Okay, so what I often people refer that to, like when you have multiple fires going on at once um, and don't really have the time to go do that right at the moment. So first thing, if, if it wasn't done well by us in training, what we always say is um, always front load things as a skill where you see kids could have a problem. So an example of a front loading from a teacher might be this class, we're gonna do class discussion which means a lot of ideas are gonna to come to you. And it's gonna be tempting to like, just share out your answer. But in order for us to stay respectful, like our wall ask us to, or we try to, we would wanna take turns at it. And so to be able to hear everybody taking turns would work best. So that means when that idea hits you, I want you to think of how you'll stop yourself. So we would only have one person talking at a time so all of us can process it. And so just think real quick of how, how you'll stop yourself when a good one comes to you and you'll be able to wait so everybody gets to hear everybody's answers. I would front load things a lot as a skill instead of a rule. And another thing you can do, um, let me jump to it so I can show it to you here. Um, I use this 
very often with kids because we know self-assessing is so important. So a level one skill would be a kid that can't do it yet. Two, they can do it with help or coaching. Three, they can do it independently. And four, they can do it on their own. I like, or they could help others do it. I like them to self-assess when I front load that class. So if blurting out to my problem, I would say class, I've been noticing. We've got a lot of times during our class where it's hard for us to stay respectful and like take the turns of like letting the person that's waiting patiently and showing that respectfulness gets interrupted by somebody that just starts. And so I don't want to go into the weeds with everybody and how everybody's doing individually. But what I want you to do right now is just on a little sticky note on your desk or on a scratch piece of paper, just write down being able to be respectful with, you know, with, with my timing on my answers. And so write down the level you see yourself right now. You're not going to hand this into me, but be honest with yourself. Use your integrity. Where are you at right now? A one would be, I mess up and I blurt out stuff. It's hard for me. I forget. I'm impulsive. Okay. A two would be, I, I do pretty good, but I may need a reminder like, hey, everybody take turns. A three is, I'm, I'm good at it. I got it. And a four is, I'm so good at it. I could probably remind some others, hey, take turns. So would you just do a little rating just where you're at right now? And any of you that don't feel like you're in that two or three, what's one little thing you could do today to try to bump yourself up into that three and four range? All right, so here we go. Let's see how we do. Man, front loading. Then when a child does it, it looks like a skill deficit to the whole class instead of I'll talk if I want to. She can't make me not share my answers. Uh, you're showing it as the skill deficit. So another way um, that I do that a lot is if I have three or four, maybe sometimes I have eight problems at one time. I mean, I, I work at some pretty rough schools and sometimes there's like two kids doing what they're supposed to and 20 not doing it. So how do I talk to 20? I can't. So what I do is I try to pull as many out of that group by my setup as I can. I say something like this, class, this definitely doesn't look like our best work. The, the one I'm seeing that we're struggling with at the moment is, is uh, giving our best effort. There's a lot of people talking and not working. And so all of you that are able to shift that on your own and don't need me, would you now go to your best effort for the next seven or eight minutes? And then I'm going to come and talk to those that need a little nudge to get to their best effort. So if you can do it without me, would you, those of you that can do that now, and then I'll be intervening with the ones that need a little extra. Well, if I can just get eight of those 10 to go, man, I'll just do it. I don't need him to come over here. That lets me now just talk to my two or three bigger kinds of challenges and problems. So I use this very often with kids. I like them to rate themselves, you know, um, on all of the skills we put on the wall, but I actually require my staff to do it too. You know, how are you right now to give them five conversations? Because if you're one or two, you're not going to see the changes in your classroom yet. I mean, we know from John Hattie's work in a research of schools that the number one way we get growth is to get people to be reflective. So why wouldn't we even start to use that with young children? I hope that helped a little bit. I kind of threw a lot of them at you there. The, the last part, I, I mean, I, would, I couldn't go into this today, but the depth of training that we go into is teaching people to actually really hear what somebody is saying in the moment. And this is probably the most unique thing, Moshi, of responsibility center discipline. We have learned by doing this for years, working with corporate people, working with children, when people don't wanna to go to the destination of responsibility, the windy hard road to responsibility, they're gonna take one of these six exits. And if you're trained enough to listen, you can usually hear which exit they're on. And people will only follow somebody they think hears them and listens to them. So it's important that our teachers can hear what exit their kids are on. So if I said, Moshi, this happens in our public schools all the time. Moshi, put your phone away. You can't have that out right now. And you said, well, he's got his phone out too. Okay. With enough training right now, everybody in the training would say this brain's leaving on exit consistency. It's not going to go to accountability until the closing of the exit consistency happens. But what happens in most schools, Moshi, is the teacher says this, I'm not talking to him, I'm talking to you. 
Well, every time you won't answer the brain, their question, answer the question their brain is asking you, it's just going to ask it again. So then the kid's going to say, so he gets to have his phone out and I don't. And then you say, you need to worry about yourself. And then the kid's going to say, well, who's going to worry about him? And then the teacher says, not you. That's my job, not yours. And then the kid says, maybe you should do your job. And then they get kicked out. Well, in a give them five conversation with skill, our teachers would have enough repetition to know the exit. So when a kid says, uh, he's got his phone out too, the teacher would say, you know what? I don't want to, I'm not going to look over there right now, but I believe you. I don't catch them all. I will give you my word. I'll talk to him in a little while. All right, I'm not going to go over there right now because if I go right now, he's going to think you told on him and then that makes things hard for you. But let's do this. Let you and I have a fair plan to have that phone put away during learning times. I don't want to take it from you. I want you to be responsible enough to have it put away during learning times. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to handle this on your own. But I want you to come up with a way that phone is not out during learning times that you can share with me before you leave class. Now I will make my way over there later in the hour and be sure the other students are held to the same standard you are. Can we get that resolved? Are you good with that? See, none of us want to go down the road to our own personal responsibility until the exit that we're on is heard and coached. So that's a deep level of skill we take our teachers through. So when people say things like this kid won't do it, well, I say I can't even really go into that yet until I hear what exit they're on. A lot of them are on benefit exit. It doesn't matter. I'm getting ready to move anyway. Even if I don't do this assignment, I still have an 80%. I mean, here come all the benefit exits. Guess what? They're the same with adults. I've been teaching 30 years. I don't need this training. I hear them all the time. That's benefit exit. What but do you instead mean? Of being a benefit, what's the benefit of buy it? You got to hear it. What's that? What's the benefit exit? What do you mean by that? I see it's down on benefit the bottom. Benefit exit is their, their brain does not see a benefit for what you're asking them to change. I see. So they're going to leave okay. on. Now I just feel controlled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take a question from uh, the user who's raising his hand or her hand. No name there. So, but uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I've been using your program. I've been trying to use it in class. And I found that I was able to talk to the boys very calmly and nicely, and they heard me. But they're five years old, and they were never able to come up with their own ideas of how can you show me that you could sit near these boys without touching them and bothering them or anything else. They can't come up with ideas on their own. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong there. No, I, I don't know that you're doing anything wrong, but let me re-explain it that that um, I gotta be age appropriate in what I expect a child to be able to do. Um, even with some of our children that have disabilities, you know, they're not gonna be cognitively at a level of coming up with a complex problem. Honestly, that little boy, Jeremy, that thought of putting someone in his pockets was pretty remarkable for a five-year-old. You know, when you really think about that, he, but it took him three weeks or two and a half weeks. What I, what I would say is sometimes you can give three or four examples that have worked with other kids for different kinds of problems. So like if a kid can't keep his hands and feet to himself, I might say, well, let me tell you something that, that a kid came up with that works for them for a different thing. When they want to blurt out an answer, they do this. Or somebody else, when they start to get too rough on the playground, they do this. So all I want is you to come, all I'm asking is to come up with one thing, but here's what else I want to tell you. We're very much about personal accountability. So instead of punishing that kid, we will pause that situation. So I say, well, let's set here until you have something you could try. And that may be for six weeks. If I'll just sit here, then that's fine. But we really would rather have you with the group as soon as you have an idea that could work. Now, it can't just be, I won't do it anymore. That's not the brain in a heuristic. Repeating the goal is not the work. That's like an addict saying, I won't drink anymore. Well, you're going to have to have strategies for when you're tired, lonely, hungry, all the things that get you. So pausing it is fine. Say, why don't we sit here until you think of one thing you could try? And then you got to be the filter of if it's a serious try or just a kid saying something to get out of it. But that, that's some of that accountability, moving it to the kid. A little phrase we use all the time is it's more powerful to pause than to punish. Because see, once you punish it, you've solved it. And can I ask you, would you give ideas for that situation? Like give him ideas of how to keep his hands to himself? No, I would give ideas maybe for other things that kids have solved. 
Um, but usually a five-year-old kind of steals another idea the first time because they've never done it before. Like, well, right. I could put something in my pocket. I'm like, well, we could try it, but I let them get as much ownership as possible. So Are they you get find that they the could do it? of it. What's that? I'm saying a child that's not so creative. You find that they could do it? It's yeah. not about being creative. It's the part of all of our brains that's a heuristic. So like uh, people misunderstand that like an artist or a creative person is heuristic. They're not any more heuristic than you and I are. It's just the part to be able to get into that space in your brain. So I, I my wife doesn't, my wife needs a heuristic to be on time. I don't has nothing to do with intelligence, but I need a heuristic when I lose my cool to not say something wrong or hurtful. I have strategies that get me back on track so I don't accidentally make a situation worse. So this child will be their first time. If in kindergarten, you can help them understand the foundations and just starting to solve little tiny bits of their problems, that's the work of kindergarten. We don't expect mastery problem solving yet, but you're building the framework. So first grade, as those brains develop more, they will start to go more and more into solving problems. And that's why we see schools that do it faithfully when they get fifth and sixth graders their problems are almost gone in school because they've been building the framework of I, I can solve my problems. See, we want kids to start to learn to count on themselves instead of people are doing stuff to me that I have control of the outcomes. That's that self-efficacy. That's that feeling of empowerment. And it comes in such subtle ways, but kids that, kids that give up easy, kids that don't, don't seem to show some of the success we want, it's really about the lack of the ability to feel confident to solve those problems. So if you can just get the groundwork started in kindergarten, you know, that's all we're asking kindergarten to do. But it's okay to say, well, we'll stay here and sit here a little way from the group until you got something you think would work. And it may take two or three tries. Larry, what, you know, one of the things I'm still struggling with here is I was, I'm re like reiterating your story with the uh, the kid in the prison. And um, uh, in as much as I appreciate there's a certain, uh, you know, authoritativeness that you're coming in with. I'm the teacher. I'm the adult. I'm the authority here, which seems to seems to resonate with the kids. But again, you know, isn't there a risk that this kid in the prison might say, "I don't really care what you have to say. I'm still doing whatever I whatever it is he that I want." He did say that. He did yeah, say and then that. What? And then what? He used the f word in my face like 13 times. I he did say all that. It had nothing to do with me. He doesn't know who I am. In so, fact, so, he's going to disrespect me. So why is he willing to do? Why is he? Because I don't wear a badge. Why is he agreeable to do something else then? Just because you he said he wasn't. He wasn't. But he's being escorted until he can come up with something, and it feels foolish to him to not be able to manage himself. That's the benefit. A that's the benefit. For the first time. So the, he the, saw that's it the, benefit the first piece. time of why? Why can't I do what other people do? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? Why would I be 17 and need to be helped? Like, I don't want to be helped. Like, let me. And that took some weeks. Do you know what I mean? So the, the benefit is not like an instantaneous, but it couldn't be like, we're going to put this guard with you. You're going to be smelling his breath every day because then he would just assault the guard over and over. We had to show him that it was a skill deficit without telling him straight to his face, you don't have skills, kid. So there's a you know. there's, it's more like a presupposition that the, the guard's with you and now let's figure out how to get rid of him. I'm on your team. Like let's that. figure out where you need him and where you don't. Mm -hmm. That kid ended up being the most improved kid of the year. Well, cool. let's go back to that other slide you were you were about to show before. Oh, I, I just wanted to show you this takes a lot of time and a great deal of work, but we do, you know, this is a, a really good one at one of our Jewish schools. But like this took them a long time. What do we really want to build into the young young people here? What's most important to us? Um, and and I know I don't know how to say some of the. I don't know how to read in 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 Hebrew. So, but sometimes you have a better the word core value. The school's core values: responsibility, respect, yeah. leadership, midos, and growth. Right. Right. So then underneath those, they tried to fine tune those for a kid's. I'm not saying they're perfect. I would do them different if I was writing my own, but it's important that the school comes up with for them what they're building. There's other ones that look like this. This is pretty complex. 
older kids. So the first thing we tell families, this is a parent book I did. I'll, I'll tell you, cause I know I have therapists and, and mental health and all the, those groups. My sister's a therapist. She wrote this book with me. It's, it's written to families cause we had so many people asking, how could you take these processes home? Um, and so we do parent nights at a lot of schools, but we, we give this, you know, we sell this to parents. Um, but my sister used to say, yeah, I don't really know what my brother does. He flies all over the world talking to people and he's not even a therapist. And so I kind of said, well, why don't you learn what I do? And why don't you write a book with me then? And so we wrote the book together and she actually uses these same practices when she teaches families how to coach those kids at home. She said, it's the simplest way to have high skills quickly. I go, well, I'm dealing with 150 teachers at a time that we have to get skilled in six months to be able to handle the problems in their classrooms. So it's got to be doable, practicable, measurable. See, I could measure your skills at it. And there's several stages after a given five conversation that we have to put into progressions as well before we call the office every time. Um, so I kind of threw a lot at you. RCD is a pretty deep, big program, but those are some of the key strokes of kind of um, some of the processes inside of it. And, and we've been blessed, you know, I learned, I've learned so much about the Jewish community because, like I said, I think I've trained between 75 and 80 Jewish schools in the last four years, wow. um, all the way from, you know, Vancouver to other parts of Canada to Miami to uh, Detroit. And that that school I showed you was in L.A. Larry, um, I'd like to go back for a moment before just before closing. You know, I'd like for you to share, obviously, what resources you have and if there's any trainings or how people can reach out to you. But I'd like to go back to Harshal. Harshal. Would you be able to unmute and, um, you know, let's see if Harshal's questions were answered that we started off with earlier in the show. Harshal, are, are you there and, and can you? Yes. Yes, I'm here. And okay. I'm, I'm trying to grasp exactly the psychology that's being impl um, um, uh, implemented over here. And I still haven't, I still haven't grasped it of the mind manipulation where that's it's the problem. If 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 we think we can coerce them and manipulate them, we're going to come at it in a way that often shuts the brain down. That's exactly what I'm dealing with. <laughs> yeah. I, so I um, if you want to break it really simple, um, the first thing you could start trying is do it in a give them five framework because it will take you out of I mean, I can't go into all the deep work today. But the mirroring neurons inside of that child's brain are going to mirror you. So as soon as you have a controlling tone and posture and voice, that brain begins to mirror back. You don't have control of me. Exactly. So that give them five helps a lot of people just get that out of the mix with the child. And then too many times we try to solve the problem. Let me just show you. I, I show it to you this, this way all the time. You're going to have to ask yourself, and I'm not being critical. I'm just asking you to do that process. You are going to have to ask yourself, when I talk to this child, how am I trying to move this child to growth? Let me share this screen with you for just a second. Am I, am I moving them through, uh, through, here's the two methods. Am I moving them? Am I leaning towards if I can find the right consequence, we call that the bigger hammer. Once I find the right consequence, like gonna take recess or gonna call your dad or gonna, is that where my brain goes to try to get the kid to do it? Or do I try to go to more relationship and encouraging words? You're a great kid, I know you can do this, I know. So what we find is you gotta sort out how you get to the balance of both of those and that give them five conversation and RCD helps people find that balance. But the problem is, is solved in that heuristic space and you cannot get a heuristic process to happen with punishment and reward. You also can't get it to happen with relational. It's somewhere inside of the child. Both of these can be used at the right phase. But I would have to ask, you know, I can't see you working with the kid. If I could see it, I could see which way we're going with it. But I would tell you the first thing to do is try that framework and then put it on pause until the kid has something they can do. 
And guys, I work with tough kids. I, I tell the story in my book, the kid that sat for four days in a room. He said, I'll rot in here before I talk to anybody. So I'm not dealing with kids that are like, oh, sorry, what do you want me to do? I mean, they're dug in. But well, my method it doesn't is... change till we get to the growth. So we'll just wait. And if we need to have parents meet with us too, we can. But we, all we're asking for is an idea before we put you back in that space so you could be successful. That's, that's what I'm doing anyway. I use the heart method and I really, uh, uh, really apply it. And I see that the child is trying, but sometimes he's trying so hard that he gets frustrated. So I say, take a breath. <laughs> Okay. Larry, that was a lot of information in a short period of time. I appreciate it. How can people um, get more and find more of what it is that you have to offer? Um, well, we are, I mean, you can go to Responsibility Center Discipline online and find more resources than you want to see, probably. Uh, there's hundreds of videos on YouTube of me teaching pieces, but our website, give them five.com. Um, we'll take you to, we have an online suite where we have support for teachers. We have classes that are, you know, you can, you can get online it, uh, we actually have animated characters that you can practice your skills against as you learn the skill of coaching that kid, um, they're cartoon characters, but they, they say the real things students say to you when you don't do it correctly. So we're very systemic in building that framework, um, we we have seen such amazing changes, but you know, only in the schools where the principals lead it. I mean, if they just want us to come and fix everybody in two days, it doesn't work that way. No, that's why I did the new book that's coming out because how do, teachers are really in a hard spot right now. Kids are as difficult as they've ever been for teachers. Mm -hmm. We're at a huge teacher shortage, and if we got to quit putting band-aids on it and retool for the lack of self-control our kids are bringing in. And I don't want to be on my soapbox too much, but society doesn't require as much self-control. So when kids get to school, all of a sudden they have to apply things they're not used to. Mm -hmm. We grew up now with these phones in our hand. We don't have to learn directions. We don't have to uh, wait for the TV. We just pause it and start it when we want to. Right, right. We don't have to go to a card catalog to find a book. I mean, at the things that used to take all that persevering and those muscles that were built in us of that self-control. <laughs> a lot of kids, when they get to school, they've never had to flex that muscle. But unless we start plugging in brains and putting the information in, <laughs> you know, they're going to have to. And so we either give up or we re-strengthen them. And, and we've just seen the schools that commit to it, we see tremendous. It's shocking if we don't see 50 to 60% fewer office referrals the first year if they do it with fidelity. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, well, thank you very much, Larry Thompson. Thank you, Achieve Behavioral, for sponsoring and making this happen. Aaron Herzog, thank you for pulling together Larry and introducing us. Um, everybody... Definitely take a look at giveem5.com. Did I say it right? Yep. Giveem5.com and uh, great resources for teachers and educators. And I think that so many of our, us mental health professionals can apply these same concepts in terms of problem solving collaboratively with the child, working together as opposed to working against uh, mastery fight versus power struggles and you know, skill, skill development and all that. So I got to leave you with this little thing. Sure. What hit me years ago is we have highly skilled people all over this country, but we rely on them instead of teaching the hundred teachers in the school to be able to do it also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we're really going to radically change is our roles change from being the expert that they bring everybody to me to teaching everybody how to do it. Got it. Yep. Absolutely. It's on us. Okay. Well, thank All you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Good to meet you. Bye.